You're watching the Coconut Daddy channel. Hey guys, welcome back to another review tonight. Uh, so tonight we've got kiddos going to go through here, or AKA um, Looky Doki is going to go Looky over the scary stories to tell in the dark. And this is produced, actually, I, I'm sorry, it, it's not directed by Guillermo del Toro. Uh, Guillermo del Toro was the producer, and this was directed by Andre Overdahl, who have the hell that is. But <laughs> Guillermo del Toro is, of course, we know him from uh, Pan's Lambreth, uh, The Devil's Backbone, the, the fish guy story where the guy was, was a fish where the girl had sex with it and won an Academy Award. So we know him from those films. Real good guy. Great, scary fantasy guy. And this is up his alley. These are a series of books. Have you read any of the books before the movie? No. I, I wish, though. I wish, though. It kind of makes you want to go out and get them now after this movie. <laughs> All right, so... I really wish that I could have seen since uh, the movie that we saw, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, since that was originally a book first, I really wish that I had the chance to read it beforehand, but I, I didn't. But right. it would have been cool to be able to like compare them side by side. Right. Now, were you ever into Goosebumps, any of the stories like that before this movie? I read a few of the R.L. Stein books that are like, right. you know, the Goosebumps books. He's um, I've been reading a lot more of his stuff now, even though he does write in, like, youth fiction. I still enjoy his stuff, but I really like some of the movie adaptations that they made from the Goosebumps books. Uh, but they scared me a lot when I was a kid, so they were definitely yeah. doing their job right. Right. And in your comparison, how do you feel that scary story does with Goosebumps? Is there kind of a, just this is more of a, of a, just like when I went to buy you some anime books i wanted to get you something because you were turning 18 so i wanted to get you something a little bit more adult you know because you know the kitty stuff is fine for kids but as you get older you know i figured your taste in anime would change and that's what i figure about this is kind of a coming to an older audience of goosebump fans you do feel that when you're watching the film um now that you mention it like that some of the monsters do remind me of something that would be manifested in an R.L. Stein Goosebumps book. So I would say I can see similarities for that. And I was satisfied with the movie. I brought my boyfriend to see it, and we really enjoyed it. So it was I, it was definitely a hit. It was good. <laughs> right. And, and for y'all that are out there, and I know I'm making fun of uh, Guillermo del Toro's uh, uh, fish story. I'm not going to see it because I'm just, you know, that stuff don't turn me on. But he does... I do recommend going to see Devil's Backbone. I do recommend going to see Pan's Lambreth. All those films are so really, um, they're just more than scary. There's a story there. There's such this vibe of fantasy world of horror. And fantasy horror is always been attracted to me because it's more than just horror. You know, you got horror where you got this, because here's the thing that makes me mad. I shouldn't say mad. But it's because of their knowledge of not watching horror. They think all horror is slasher film horror. And horror, to me, slasher horror is kind of like pop metal. You know, like you got heavy metal, right? Where you got the people who, you know, you know, where you got the detailed lyrics and what the person is struggling through and the poet, you know, from Black Sabbath and on to, you know, the origins of metal. Then you, in the 80s, we had pop metal, and basically it was just cookie cutter. You know, here's another pop metal. Here's more hairspray, more band, and that's pop metal. And that's what I feel about slasher films. You know, slasher films are pop horror. They were films that were to capitalize on the market, and it, it kind of just threw, you know, what people grew up in horror to be. You know, it kind of throws away fantasy horror like this or you know these stories of horror so so let's start with our story of characters what's going on here with uh, these characters okay so basically we have this girl what is her name let's see if it says the name uh shadow of the bellows family okay 
Stella? Gosh, was it was Stella? Like, You're talking about Stella? It was Stella. It was Stella. Stella. It was, uh, she was Stella. like the main girl. <laughs> she was the main girl in the story, and then she had um, her main love interest friend, who his name was Ramon. Uh, I guess and then I'll I'll say the names and then I'll discuss the characters. And then we have Charlie and then we had the other kid with the Augie. sister. And Augie. His name. Augie. Yes. Yeah. Short for Augie. Did you see it? <laughs> I was out in nature. Did you read about it? How do you know the character's name? Well, I mean, I've had to study up before we do this every time. So no, I was in tune to nature <laughs> last night. I had the scariest event last night too while we were out because we went out to these flat rocks I, you know where garden of the gods is right you've been out there right you know where they got the you know where people have died from going the cliffs and hiking and everything well we went to a place called um devil's wilderness and there was another place called uh, it was it was a place where the bigfoot sightings were we went there too because i wanted to see you know why people were thinking they saw bigfoot and i could see why that people would think they would see bigfoot but we went to Devil's Lake, and it was kind of like Garden of the Gods. There's no restriction on these rocks. You can climb them as high as possible. And there was this waterfall that was not active, and the kid was climbing down there, and I was just scared to death watching it. It just like my heart was, you know what I'm saying? Because I looked away because, you know, I was taking pictures, and I was imagining this kid falling off these rocks, and I was going to get the pictures. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. no, I don't want that. And I was so scared to death. And he, apparently his dad was there, and I was talking. I said, no, no, no. He said, that's okay. I taught him that. I'm like, whatever, dude, whatever. You know, I'm not going to get into it, you know, but I'm freaking out because I'm afraid this kid's going to fall down and smash his head. But whatever, dude, you know, I mean, I'm not going to watch it. I just like turned my head, but that just, that is just scary to watch someone with no safety harness, just climbing these rocks. And because, I mean, he's one, he's, his head would gone. I was so scared. I was going to get it on video. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to have a snuff film today. Not today. Not having. All right. So back to this scary movie with Augie, Stella and Ramon <coughs> Tommy and Harold. <laughs> Tommy and Harold. Yes. Okay. So uh, I guess we'll start with Stella. She was the main girl. She uh, lived alone with her father, and she was kind of like not a very popular girl in school and just had, you know, this little group of friends. And she's the one who originally was like, hey, we're going to go. It's Halloween. Let's go see this haunted house. And then there is Ramon. Ramon you meet whenever uh, they are all running. I, I feel like I need to like put things placed in different orders and I wish I could just, okay. Anyway, Tommy, we're gonna talk about Tommy first. Tommy is the bully character and he ends up like tormenting their little group of friends and um, is chasing them and in order for them to meet Ramon they were being chased by Tommy and they jumped into Ramon's car and he was like yo who are you who jumped into my car and they're like oh please let us hide in here we're hiding from this crazy guy with the baseball bat who was Tommy um, then we have the other two friends Charlie who uh, he is basically on his own right now because his parents were on vacation somewhere like out of the country. And then we had Augie who has an older sister who is also in the story and uh, ends up going with them to the this haunted house and everything. Yes, so those are our top characters. And this is, uh, this is where we get into finding Sarah Bellows, a little bit of the origin. <laughs> of cerebellos which is just a creepy thing within itself how do you like the 1968 thing what do you think of that i they did a good job with it definitely um for it being a bit of a setback a little bit older of a time hey do you think it's um, funny that the last movie that you watched was what 1969 and this was in 68 
maybe that's why I was a little more used to the style. I don't know. Do you, you think that's going to, like, affect fashion? Yeah, most definitely it does. It, uh, yeah. it affects a lot of different things, like the way that the characters talk, uh, the way that the characters, like do a lot of things, you know, because just things are so different nowadays. Like if I need to find information and I live back in the sixties, where am I going? I'm not going to Google. There's no Google, you know, <laughs> but it makes horror movies easier when you don't have cell phones. Yeah. That's, that's another thing. It's like, you know, you're like, cause you can imagine how many stories that would be throw out that you have to, because there's cell phones. Cause it's like, you know, for, you know, like you're sitting there, I, I get so many storylines. Well, I, I would call the police on my cell phone. Okay. Well, throw that story. Yeah. Out. You know, like I. <laughs> right. And now, now they don't have cell phones. So I don't know, man, that, you, just, you can't, you can't think about it. You can't be like, somebody help me. I'm in the basement. <laughs> There's no Twitter. Uh, so uh, so we go into the house the house of the Bellows family and they are all gone. This is a haunted house and it's been abandoned for a while now. Well, we find out that Sarah, the daughter of the Bellows family, was kept locked in the basement and uh, said to be crazy. And so she was, you know, tortured and kept away in isolation from her family and she was she kept this book this crazy scary book that the kids end up finding that she ends up writing that sarah would write scary stories with blood and she would sit by her wall and tell these scary stories to young children who come now to the house to like hear these stories and then they end up going missing like, they don't die, they end up just, like, vanishing and never returning. So, now these kids are locked in the basement of this scary house. And the girl, Stella, takes the book and, you know, puts it in her bag and everything. And the house just kind of, like, magically unlocks and they let them go. And they're, like, you know, they run away and they're, like, whoa, that was so scary. I'm so glad we're gone and everything. And then um, Stella brings the book home and she opens it and is reading it and it starts writing a story on its own. Like it just starts appearing on the pages. Uh, and it's a story about a boy named Tommy and about Harold the Scarecrow. Harold, everybody loves Harold. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I'm trying to, like, I don't want to sit and, like, tell the story and explain it. You got to go see the movie because it's absolutely amazing. I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but right. uh, they did a really good job taking Harold because you see him before he's, like, too monsterfied, and then you see him during the story like whenever the story's happening and then you see him after the fact, after all of the events unfold. And it's just, it's a really cool progression of like, <laughs> it's good scarecrow character development. If you yeah. ask me, right. that's and, what I have to say. And I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, so, something I'll tell you, if people like, you know, movies about scarecrow, one I will recommend as a horror film, it was actually a TV film and it's called night of the scarecrow. And you can get it uh, streamed now. People have praised it. It has a director's cut. And this was a TV movie. And it scared the crap out of kids. And it basically, what it was is just a kid who, I know it was a man who was, you know, he was, you know, mentally challenged. And he was accused of a crime that he didn't commit. So his mother told him, go out there and hide you know, in the scarecrow, you know, and where you used to hide. And so he dresses up as a scarecrow or he dresses up as a scarecrow out there. And then they realize that that's him. So they kill him. Right. And so then all these events happen where the scarecrow is involved with the, uh, you know, revenge of this thing. And it's a great little movie and it was made in the eighties and it was just a cult classic because kids could watch it.
it because it it was on television, you know, which means no cussing, no bare, you know, breast or anything. It, it which meant writers are challenged. It's like okay, you have to do something neat. Well, we just put some girls in. We can't do that. This is television. Well, we'll have to. I don't know. Create a story. Yes, that'll do it. Let's write a story. And so they wrote a scary story. And as a kid, that movie frightened me to death. And nobody, and then it was gone. You know, it maybe aired one more time on television, and that was it. And you never heard from the story. And then YouTube came along, and someone had taken a videotape and played it. And I just, as soon as I saw it on YouTube, I was like, I got to watch that again. And I was like, oh, my gosh, they wrote a scary story. And it was just great. So, and st- st- I don't know what it is about scarecrows, but it works, man. It works. It really does. So, Harold is just I like one it. of the biggest things that came out from this movie that's really been t- people talking about. But it gets even it better than that. Because <laughs> it just doesn't stop there. Because you got Augie's demise, and then of yeah, course, there's, there's, Tommy's there's, demise. There's, there's a- um, the next one I think ends up being my favorite. It's uh, <sighs> uh, are you gonna go in order? Yeah, let's go in order because I want to keep it. Because, yeah, let's go the next one. Okay, yeah, the next one's like my favorite. <laughs> okay, one. oh, you like that one better. It, okay, huh? you like that one better than the last one. This one that we're about to talk about, right? You like it? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. This, one, this one's a good one. Uh, this one has to do with Charlie. This one's Charlie. And uh, Charlie's just at home. And it's the... Oh, yeah, it's the... It starts writing a story about a stew. And he oh, starts yeah. eating the stew. <laughs> and there's a toe in it. And it's... it's there, there you go, foot fetish people. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I hope that takes, I hope but that cures them. I like this one because whenever this monster gets him, right, it drags him under the bed and he leaves uh, fingernail marks. Oh, yeah. That looks really cool. Yeah. He left fingernail marks trailing under the bed all the way to the wall. So it's like he he was dragged down to hell or somewhere, and he's you know he's gone, but you can see the fingernails go all the way to the wall, which was I thought was the coolest one, for sure. Uh, the next story has to do with the sister and a spider bite. Uh, this was a really cool monster because it just it like came from an, a spider bite on mm. her face came from a spider bite and yes that one was awesome too um (laughs) i'm trying not to like tell all of it you know so i'm trying to like pick and choose the next one uh it progresses and they're trying to find they bring back the book to the house and um then the book just appears back in her room and they're like oh my god we can't get rid of this book we're all gonna die you know so it keeps progressing, and now they're trying to figure out more about Sarah, Sarah Bellows, who we you know was tortured in this house. So they're going to the hospital, and they want to—they're asking to look at all the records. And um, basically, they just sneak back into this other place of the hospital. And this is when Augie tells everyone that he's been having this dream of this woman taking him from a red room. And they all end up getting separated whenever Stella finds, you know, the records and everything she was looking for. Uh, all the alarms go off and every room in this white hospital turns red because of all the alarms. Yeah, that was cool. Well, you notice there's a connection between <laughs> the red spot and the red room. Think about it. I would... Will- a little I could I don't really understand the significance of the red spot well I mean you said red room, never red, red spot and red room 
Yeah, at one point during the last uh, story, a red spot appeared on his sh- his shirt for some reason, and I didn't un- I didn't understand the connection between them. I didn't understand the significance of the red spot in general, actually. So well, that's something we need that to was, do research on. If yeah. you guys know what the red spot is, comment below. We'd like to know, and. <laughs> I, Fill us with your knowledge. I almost forgot about the Ruth story. And, of course, you know, that's more, f- which is attacking more. That would be scary for younger people, the Ruth story. You know, with the spiders. I hated that one. Uh, just because I hate spiders. Right, so that's much. what I was saying. That, that, that was more attacking of the youth. But there's a lot of spider connection. You know, like the one kid wanted to be Spider-Man. The spiders in the haunted house, the spiders coming out of the zit, the, um... (laughs) Okay, so we have about ten minutes. Um, so the next story that starts to get written, uh, is Ramones. And it's, it's, it's really weird. They're, at this time, um... The monster comes down as just a head... And then all the other body parts come raining down through through the fireplace, okay? And then it assembles, and then it just it's, it's crawling towards him, trying to you know trying to get him. Um, yeah. And then Stella and Ramon they both get out, and they are running back. They're trying to get back towards the house, and I'm trying to remember why they're going to the house. Uh. I don't remember why they're going to the house, but they are. They're going back to the house, probably to try and, like, oh, yeah, they're trying to make Sarah stop being mean and writing all these stories and killing everybody. Right. And then um, Stella goes into the house, and it looks like it's old time. Like, it looks like it's restored and as if the house is being lived in, and it's, it's just a beautiful, you know, big house. It doesn't look like a big scary mansion like it did, you know, when they first went in. And uh, basically, it's as if she's Sarah and the family is, like, um, looking for her, playing hide-and-seek, and then they find her and they throw her into the basement and everything. And, uh, yeah, that's that one's her story. And she ends up finding Sarah and just being like, why do you you need to stop all of this killing? I'll tell your story. I'll tell everybody that, you know, your family tortured you and everything. I'll tell everybody uh, exactly how it was. And then she gets the pen from Sarah and has to write it with, start writing it with her own blood before Sarah just kind of like, let's go. Yay. <laughs> And, and you know, and in some ways that is kind of connection to the ring, you know, because you got to keep the story going on, which is how the ring ended. And that, was, you know, which is the classic Japanese horror film. I mean, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, that's I, one I, I've seen Jew, all the Juon movies, but I haven't seen the ring. Yes. And the ring, I mean, I've seen the Japanese versions and the American, the American versions, a lot of people say is a lot better. Well, it's a little bit more intense. It doesn't make it better because I think the ring in intentionally is not really a horror story. It's more of just a story. And again, there you go. There's a difference between story, but you know, they kind of extremed it up a little bit. Well, you talk about a few years later, five years later, you know, was with the new ring story. And the Ringo stories, I mean, they, you know, which are still popular in Japan and they're still popular here in America as well. Those stories, and, and I look at that, and that's what kind of started that trend, which is okay, you know, that they add, you just keep on adding. I think what my personal opinion about this film is I think this film is about how important it is um, for the media, why it's a good, uh, what you would call a, I call a, police basically something to be a how important the media is because Stella first of all doesn't want to write for you know you know high school newspaper Mm -hmm. and and I think this is to motivate her and then of course you got the story about the town who's poisoned the water 
and nobody wants to know about it nobody and so this is it's very connection to nowadays where everybody feels how unimportant the media is and they feel like this story is yeah i mean the media i yes definitely is the press is very very important and this kind of has that tie in to that and I feel that's that's kind of the reason the little bit, you know, for instance, you know, like we have the boy who is, you know, draft dodger, you know, and so mm-hmm. you you see that element as well. The bye bye bird. Yeah, that was one thing that definitely was, you know, mm-hmm. a time period situation. Right. And so and that's what I'm saying. I think that to me is kind of what the story is about is the importance of telling stories why it's important to keep your history and let people know because you know things like this i mean because if you don't sarah bella's going to come back and kill you with the jangly man and uh, jangly man you what you do your feelings i mean i mean that of course i'm used to that kind of monster in uh della morte's uh movies because you look at Pan's Lambreth, there's this connection between those two monsters there, between Jangly Man. So, I mean, he does... I, I thought it was very interesting how he would, yeah. like, fall apart and then put himself back together. I right. thought that was cool. And that's something, like, I'm used to him in his movie Pan's Lambreth. You go back to Pan's Lambreth. There's a character that has eyes, and he has to take the eyes and put them on his face, and he puts the eyes Ooh. down. It's you have to watch Pan's Lambreth one night. It is just a really good movie. But the thing is, I feel with his movies with Devil's Backbone and Pan's Lambreth, the real monsters are not the monsters themselves. The real monsters are the humans. For instance, like Devil's Backbone, there's all this bombing going on in Spain, and then of course there's a Spanish Revolution that's going on in Pan's Lambreth. So the monsters are really the humans, and then the monsters there have a story, and of course it's a sad ending at Pan's Lambreth. It's like, oh that's not fair. It shouldn't be that way. And you feel that way, but it's a horror story, you know. It goes back to, if you go back to the old fairy tales, because like in the original Little Red Riding Hood, she's like red is actually eaten by the wolf. Yeah, but that's true. Right, and then years later, and then the pigs and like all the ones like that. Yeah, yeah. and years later we change it to happy innings so kids can deal with the situation. Who's your daddy? 